Sorry, I should switch on my microphone. I was asking whether Tanzania's team was ready to start. Thank you, Ma Madam President and, and members. The respondent is ready. Fine, so you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, the respondent uh, does not have a, a PowerPoint uh, presentation, but uh, just a few exhibits to highlight uh, to the members of the tribunal. And in our presentation, we have uh, subdivided it. So four of us will be making the, the presentation. Myself, Mr. George Mandepo, Mrs. Salome Magesa, and uh, Ms. Uh, Concessa Kahendaguza. Uh, basically, our, our submission is divided into uh, uh, four parts. Uh, the first one is to give a general overview of the issues uh, before this tribunal so as to give it context on what parties are arguing about and what are the issues. Uh, the second is to elaborate on the respondent's defense on the respondent defense and here we <coughs> characterize the key issues uh, in our view which the, uh, the respondent uh, is addressing the tribunal and those which are, are subject for determination. But in doing so, before highlighting the issues, we also provide a brief overview of our understanding of the claimant's case but also uh, another issue that we address in our submission is uh, the issue of compensation, quantum of compensation, and the methods used and the areas of divergency between the respondent and the claimant. And finally, we give a conclusion uh, specifically here of what we consider to be the reliefs that uh, the respondent is entitled to. Uh, having said so, I will now uh, leave the floor to my colleague, uh, Concessa Kahendaguza, to start off the first part, and then we shall proceed in that sequence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President and the Honorable arbitrators. Um, my presentation, as it was introduced by our senior counsel, will rely on the introduction of this matter and the other some few issues concerning this matter. The center of this dispute is the abolition of the tenure of retention license done in 2017 by the government of Tanzania through amendments made to the Mining Act 2020 by repealing Section 37 and 38 of the said Act. The publication of the Mining, mining Regulations of 2018 as well as the other administrative measures undertaken to implement these legislative measures. Therefore, it is the claimant's claim before this tribunal that these measures undertaken by the government of Tanzania has resulted into expropriation of the claimant investment in Tanzania, thus the claimant is entitled to compensation. Win share, or the claimant in this case, submitted this dispute against the United Republic of Tanzania uh, in the present case and uh, the agreement between the government of Canada and the government of the United Republic of Tanzania for the promotion and reciprocal protection of investment, which entered into force on 9th December 2013. In this case, would be referred as Canada, Tanzania, BIT, or the treat, and the Convention on the Settlement of Investment Disputes between the states and nationals of other states, which would be referred as XCD Convention. It is general understanding that BITs are for the purpose of protecting private investment to develop market orientation, 
programs partner countries and support the development of international law standard consistent with the identified objectives. Tanzania being one of the developing countries as BITs with 20 countries. The said BITs were entered in with the view of stimulating economic development, increase employment opportunities, enhance countries' finance and technology transfer, among others. Contrary to the expectations of Tanzania, in the process of implementation of BITs, some of the investors are abusing the use of BITs and fail to comply with the host state national laws, regulations regulating investment. As a result, some of investors use the BITs as a basis of institute, fresh and vexatious arbitral proceedings claiming huge sum of money against Tanzania. Throughout these proceedings, Tanzania will demonstrate how multinational companies like WinShare, its shareholders, or officers may abuse investment treaties. In this dispute, the respondent will demonstrate that the claimants, the claimants two key witnesses, one Mr. Richard William and Mr. Christopher McKenzie, are not citizens of Canada. Further to that, on 31st May 2002, they incorporated an offshore Buffex Holding Limited in the British Virgin Island. In April 2006, Buffex Holding Limited incorporated Buffex Tanzania Limited, BTL, in which it held 99% shares and 1% share held by Elio. Surprisingly, Buffex Holding Limited did not make any investment in Tanzania. Even the operation undertaken by BTL in Tanzania were directly supervised directly by the claimant's chief executive officer and the director of Buffex Tanzania Limited, Mr. Richard William, UK national, and residing in Canada. This also explains the reason why, despite the fact that the retention license in contention were held by BTL, neither BTL or any other officers have been made party of these proceedings. The respondent is the United Republic of Tanzania, a third world and developing country like other developing states, has achieved relative economic growth and gradually declining poverty rates. The country remains a lower middle income country. Much of the country's development success over the decade was predicted on a strategic maritime location, rich and diverse natural resources, and social political stability, as well as its rapidly, rapidly growing tourism. With an area of 947,000 square kilometers, Tanzania has a population of about 61.5 million, of which about one third live in urban areas. Tanzania 2021 GDP was USD dollar 67.8 billion, while its per capita income in 2021 was about 1,100 USD dollar 1,136. The government of Tanzania recognizes the great potential that the mineral sector holds in contributing towards national economic development. In spite of various efforts to improve the contribution of sector to economy, many Tanzania have voiced serious concerns about little the country is benefiting from large-scale mining. Different committees were we are formed in Tanzania to investigate the mining sector in Tanzania to come, and to come up with the findings and suggestions. One of the committee was the Bomani Report of 2008, for example, pointed out that despite the presence of a huge number of mineral reserves, the contribution of this sector to the national economy and the community development is not meeting the citizens' expectations compared to other sectors in the economy. The development of the mining industry in Tanzania is closely defined by political, social, and economic transformations. From 2009 to 2018, the government of Tanzania undertook several measures 
through police, legislative, and the administrative to reform the mining sector. The major policy objective behind those measures was to ensure that the mining sector contributes to the economy by ensuring a win-win between the investor and the government. The notable reform included the adoption of the mining policy in 2009 to replace the 1997 mining policy, repeal the 1998 mining act that was replaced by the 2020, 2010 mining act, processing of beneficiation and the value addition of precious metal, several amendments to the 2010 mining act, including those of 2017, the enactment of the Natural Wealth and Resources Permanent Sovereignty Act number no. 6 of 2017, and the enactment of natural wealth and resources contracts review and renegotiation of unconscionable terms, which is Act Number no. 7 of 2017. The remaining Act in 20, 2010 provided for respecting license, retention license, special mining license, and mining license. The prospecting license conferred the order a right to prospect for minerals, and the upon the discovery of potential significant mineral resources, the order of, pros of prospecting license was entitled to apply for special mining license or the mining license. The grounds for detention license were described under the Mining Act of 2010, terms and condition and the condition for holding the same. In 2017, Tanzania amended the Mining Act 2010, which among, among other things, abolished the tenure of retention license. This was followed by publication of the Mining Mineral Rights Regulations of 2018, under which the retention license reverted to the government. The respondent will demonstrate that the 2017 amendment were done for attainment of public purpose, ensure effective utilization of natural resources for the benefit of the people of the United Republic of Tanzania and the investors in a win-win situation. Tanzania being a sovereign state had to pursue some regulatory measures to reform its mining industry in order to enable all investors in the extractive sector and the government to equally benefit from the available natural resources. The next part I will submit on is the claimant's claim. This will be in a brief. The claimants were grieved with the amendments made to the Mining Act 2010, the publication of the Mining Regulation of 2018, and the December 2019 advertisement by the tender of the areas under the retention license, including the claimant's SMP project. The claimants alleged that the respondent unlawfully expropriated the claimant's investment in Tanzania and has committed other breaches of the BIT, including the obligation to accord the claimant investment fair and equitable treatment. As a result of the respondent conduct, the claimant lost its alleged investment in Isazama Congress um, to be known as SMP project. The claimant further states that the alleged expropriation was not for a public purpose, was discriminatory, and was not done in accordance with the due process of law, was not accompanied with pro prompt, adequate, and effective compensation, and that the respondent did not accord the claimant investment fair and equitable treatment that frustrated the claimant legitimate expectation. In the circumstance, therefore, the claimant claims to have suffered loss and the damages amounting to Canadian dollar uh, 124.78 million, including the investment cost and the pre award interest. The retention license in dispute were granted to Buffex Tanzania Limited, a company incorporated in Tanzania. Buffex Tanzania Limited or BTL are Buffex shareholders of BTL, are Buffex Holding Limited with 99 ordinary shares. 
and the oil resources of Canada with one ordinary share, making a total of 100 shares. The directors of BTL are Christopher James Mackenzie, a citizen of the United Kingdom and a resident of the United Kingdom, and Richard David William, a UK national and a resident of Canada. According to records, Tanzania has never transacted with Winisha Gold Corp in the mining sector. There, there are no records connecting the claimant with the BTL as investor under Canada Tanzania BIT. The claimant or Winisha has identified itself as a company incorporated in Canada and it was formerly known as Aerial Resources Corporation. Corp, which is a shareholder of Buffett Tanzania Limited as incorporated in Tanzania to deal with the exploration activities for gold in Sazama Congolos, earlier located within Ichunya district in Mbea, now Songwe region in Tanzania. However, the said subsidiary company, Buffett Tanzania Limited, was the older, who was the older of prospecting license, pursuant mining legislation was purposely left to be part of these proceedings, neither no officer was called to be witness in these proceedings. Winnie Share claims to have invested in tens of millions of dollars of expenditure and the considerable time and effort to explore and develop Sazama Congress Gold Project. Saza Macongolos Gold Project. But the respondent will demonstrate that there was no any investment made by Winnie Share in Tanzania, and in any case, such alleged investment, if at all proven, had never cost the amount claimed by Winnie Share in this arbitration. I also submit in a brief on the overview of the respondent defense. The center of this dispute lies in Sazama Congress project in Tanzania. The claimant alleged that through BTL owns four retention licenses, which are R009 stroke 2014 at Isaza earlier. Retention license 0010, stroke 2014, at the area called the Gap. Retention license number 0011, stroke 2014, at the area called the Quaer. And retention license number 0012, stroke 2014, at Iruga area. Also, the claimant owned nine prospecting licenses as it has been mentioned under paragraph 100 to paragraph 105 of the claimant's memorial. The dispute arises out of four retention licenses, while nine prospecting licenses were not cancelled. However, the claimant's claim covers the whole project, including the areas with the prospecting licenses. Under this part, the respondent will demonstrate its defense through four issues, which are the following. One, the respondent will state that the tribunal has no jurisdiction to determine this matter. The second issue that the claimant has not made any investment in Tanzania. Third, the respondent has never expropriated the claimant's investment in Tanzania. Four, fourth, the claimant is not entitled to any compensation. But in the alternative to this issue number four, it, in the event the tribunal finds that the claimant is entitled to compensation, the amount to compensation will not be Canadian 124.78 million dollar as they have claimed.
In this, in this submission, the respondent submitted that in September 2014, Buffex Tanzania Limited was granted with four retention license, as I have mentioned them, which later in 2017 were cancelled by the respondent through the amendment which were done in the Mining Act of 20, 2010. The respondent stated that the grant and cancellation of retention license was in accordance with the laws of Tanzania and that the cancellation of referred license above does not amount to expropriation. In its counter memorial, the respondent clearly explained the purpose of abolition of retention license that were to improve the mining sector for the benefit of both Tanzania and investors. Further to that, all amendments enacted Laws Bill explained the purpose of the changes in the mining sector. The following part is the respondent defense against the, the claimant's claim. Under this part, I will start with the jurisdiction of uh, this uh, tribunal. Under this point of jurisdiction, the respondent submit that the tribunal lacks the jurisdiction to determine this matter on the two reasons. One, shareholding structure of BTLO does not include win share. And the second point is that ICSID is not a proper forum for challenging a statute repugnant in Tanzania. To start with point number one, that shareholding structure of BTL does not include wind share. The respondents submit that there is no any record in Tanzania to justify wind shares ownership of shares in BTL to fit the protection under any investment treaty or international customary law. According to records from the business registration and racing, and licensing agents, Brera, which is mandated in Tanzania to register all companies and in those any changes in the register of a particular company, when share is not registered. The registered shareholders of BTL are Buffex Holding Limited, BHL with 19 ordinary shares and LEO Resources Corporate of Canada with one ordinary share. I repeat, I submit that the registered shareholders of BTL are Buffex Holding Limited with 99 ordinary shares and Aerial Resource Corp of Canada with one ordinary share, making a total of 100 ordinary shares, which is the cumulative number of the company shares in composition of share capital. From this structure, the name of win share is not reflected. However, the claimant has alleged to have changed its name from Elliot to win share in 2020. Are not, those changes are not reflected to the record of the host state contract section 436 sub 3 of the business laws, miscellaneous amendment act of 2012 already together with the companies Act Cap 212. That uh, submission was detailed, explained in the respondent counter memorial. The respondent submits that if there was a change of name from Elio Resource Corp to Inisha Gold, the claimant was required to comply with the host state laws by notifying the registrar of such changes of which made the respondent incognizant of the claimant as a shareholder. Similar, under Section 123 of the Many Act, the claimant was required that any changes, variation to the company should be registered to the Many Commission. However, the alleged changes by Winnie Share Gold Corp have never been registered. In 
to the commission, when she goal the cooperation is a known person to the BTL shareholding structure. Nani compliance to the Tanzania Companies Act and the remaining act by, claim, by the claimant is a contrary to the requirement of the BIT that the foreign nationals are subject to comply with the domestic laws of the host state. It is thus submitted that ICSID has no jurisdiction to determine the claims brought by Winisha since, no, since it has not made investment through BTL. It is the respondent's submission that for an investor to benefit from the protection under the BIT, it should establish that at all time during the investment complied full with the domestic laws of the contracting state. In this case, Tanzanians' laws. The second point under this part of jurisdiction, the respondent states that the claimant is challenging the written laws, Miscellaneous Amendment Act 2017, which is amending legislation and which cancelled the legislative basis of retention license and the remaining minor rights regulation of 2018, which reverted the retention license license to the government. The respondents submit that, both in principle and practice, Tanzania law, laws lay down a very elaborative procedure for challenging the validity or other ways of a statute in the context of Bill of Rights entrenched in Article 12 to 19 of the Constitution of the United Republic of Tanzania, which is realized through the Basic Rights and Duties Enforcement Act of 1919, of 1994, and the basic rights and duties enforcement practice procedure rules of 1924. In particular, the Tanzania constitutional provision vests jurisdiction to determine the, constitution the constitutionality of interior established in the High Court of Tanzania where any person, including a juridic, a juristic person like the claimant, who alleged that this right have been violated or the operation of law may petition to the High Court of Tanzania for redress. Therefore, the tribunal being vested with powers to determine investment disputes under Article 25, Sub 1 of the XD Convention has no jurisdiction to determine the validity of the changes made it to Tanzania mining laws in 2017 and the introduction of new regulation of 2018. The second point of defense of the claimant is that the claimant has not made investment in Tanzania. It is the respondent's submission that Winnie Share has never made, has never been an investor in Tanzania. Its claim against Tanzania for violation of Tanzania obligation under the agreement between Government of Canada and the Government of the United Republic of Tanzania for promotion of the spoke protection of investment, BIT, is unfounded and must fail. Winnie Share center of claim for, for exploration is on the amended legislation of 2017 and the republication of the mining minor rights regulation of 2018, which is government notice number one of 2018, as well as the advertised tender of, 20, of December 2019. In this proceeding, Tanzania has and will indeed show that it did not in any ways violate Winnie shares right under the retention license, which Winnie share had never possessed. It is submitted, therefore, that as a Winnie share has no any investment in Tanzania, there was no, there was nothing to expropriate. In any event, that the tribunal finds that Winnie share had invested in Tanzania through SMP retention license, the said investment was never expropriated either through 
the amending legislation or alleged invitation to tender for the areas which in all materials aspects the alleged tender did not materialize to an award to any bidder. Therefore, there was no any expropriation either by the date of operationalization of the laws or publication of the invitation to tender. There is no any record to link winning share with the BTL so as to justify its ownership to BTL. Before filing of this notice for, the, for arbitration, Tanzania has never received any record that Elio had changed its name to WinShare. Therefore, it is for the WinShare to claim that it is an investor in this dispute in which a state party to BIT has never known to the purported investor before filing of this dispute. Tanzania will establish that it has not expropriated the claimant's investment either through amending legislation of 2017 or regulations of 2018 or the invited tender of 2019. In the circumstances, therefore, the claimant's claim for compensation is without any merit that it must file. The alleged tender of 2019 through mining commission website could not any material respect regarded as an act of expropriation as none of the alleged projects areas were awarded to any investor. The claimant assertion that its claim meets the jurisdiction requirement under both the BIT and its deconversion is totally misleading. The respondent has established that the claimant being incorporated under the laws of British Columbia, Canada, with its registered headquarters in Vancouver, B BC, had made no investment in Tanzania and INS does not qualify as an investor under Article 1 of the BIT. The respondent states that under Tanzania rules, the retention license were granted pass one to section 37 and 38 of the, of the mining act to the order of prospecting license after establishing that the applicant has identified the minor deposit of potential commercial significance within the prospecting area. But the minor deposit cannot be developed immediately by reason of technical constraints, adverse market condition, or other economic factors which are or may be of temporary character. The respondent submitted that the crucial reason for granting the retention license is that the respondent, the older prospecting license has identified a mineral deposit which is potentially of commercial significance, but it cannot develop the project to a mining immediately by reason of technical constraint adverse market, not otherwise. The respondent states that the claimant was supposed to have feasibility study at the time of applying the retention license. Section 32, sub 1D of the Mining Act, CAP 1, 2, 3, provided opportunity for the older prospecting license after the end of tenure of second period of renewal to apply for extension of two years to complete a feasibility study. Thus, the two years extension was granted to the retention holder to finalize the feasibility study. That means by the end of two years extension, the older presumed to have completed feasibility study and ready to, and ready to apply for mining license or special mining license. Thus, if there were no economic constraints, technical or adverse market, the older was supposed to apply for mining license or special mining license. At the time of applying retention license, the older was supposed to have feasibility study. Section 37 and the Section 38 of the Mining Act came into picture after the older retention license fulfilled the conditions attached under Section 32 of the Mining Act. Under the Mining Act, the retention license intended the older to to apply only for mining license, not for special license, mining license, 
where the applicant so chooses. Further, the renewal of the retention license was only granted where the commercial development is not possible and cannot be granted upon the fulfillment of the condition as directed by the minister and not automatic renewal as described by the claimant. The respondent states that the records of the claimants in Tanzania do not show that the claimants identified the resources which are commercially significant under BTL project. The SMP had not reached a stage that proves that the project was commercially significant to establish mining operations. The claimant admits that in order for the project to reach the mining stage, further drilling was required. This has uh, been stated by the claimant under paragraph 138 of the claimant's memorial. The respondent submission is supported by the claimant's own evidence through Exhibit C, 0159 at page 117, which show that the resources indicated were not commercially significant to establish meaning as the claimant added to improve confidence of the available mineral resource estimates and the subsequent estimates. Moreover, the report recommended that for the project development to commence additional drilling, the study to preliminary economic assessment pair to increase mineral resources inferred and learning from the adjacent Shanta. Since the current claim for this tribunal is previous and vexatious. Since the claimant had not discovered significant mineral resources to enable them to apply for mining license, as clearly stated in their own exhibit 0159. The mineral resources discovered were at inferred resources which required further exploration. Based on this ground, even if the gold price could improve, the claimant could still not be able to commence mining operations since it was required to, co to conduct further exploration to discover proven mineral resources. The respondent positioned that the claimant does not have a valid standing in these present proceedings. Winnie Shear's claim for damages is even less credible if it is considered that almost 100% of the total amount claimed is based on a hypothetical fair market value of its investment assessed at the date of average devaluation date, which is 19 December 2019, when the mining commission issued the invitation to tender purporting to SMP retention license areas to the IST bidder. Winnie Share cannot seriously argue that in a regulatory framework such as that in force in Tanzania, where there has been several changes of policy and illegal framework in the mineral sector, it is unreasonable to assume that the laws will remain unchanged. This proves that this arbitration is no more than an attempt by Winnie Share to unjust and rich or rip from what it had not planted in submitting to exceed the previous and the obvious speculative claims. Tanzania is a developing country seeking to position itself in the global scenario as productive economy. When she claim in this arbitration consists constitutes an abuse of the international system for the protection of foreign investment. The respondent submits that at the outset that neither violate the condition and SMP retention license or obligation of Tanzania under any international law. Tanzania being the sovereign state had to pursue some regulatory measures to reform its mining industry in order to enable all investors in the extractive sector to qualify to equally benefit with the available resources. The respondent submits that in respect to SMP gold project, there is 
nor any record of expenditure to disclose the movement of Forex from the alleged Canadian company to BTL in Tanzania. There is no any proof that the alleged funds raised outside Tanzania were meant and actually spent for the project. Financial statement by Elio contradict with the reality as regards to the investment in a million of Canadian dollars in Tanzania. The fact is that there was a negotiation with the Shanta to sell the mines is vivid proof that the alleged project was not economical as purported, and all alleged private placement to retail investors were not beneficial to the project in dispute. The contradiction as alleged to the takeoff of the project can be seen from the fact that the same area who purported to have been affected by Tanzania through amending legislation and abolition of retention license was before in this dispute with the alleged illegal manners and later intended to sell the project. These contradictory statements suggest that the claimant is a dishonest investor and acted not in good faith. To prove that the claimant was dishonest, the fact on the ground suggested that the claimant managed to acquire retention license without having any feasibility study for the project earlier. One may ask how a serious investor can claim for a million dollars without any study which pro provides an analysis of investment cost and expected profit on investment. As it will be demonstrated by evidence in this case, as a foreign investor, LEO misused the acquired retention license by BTL for its own benefits. The abuse of retention license can be drawn from the decision by LEO to sell the project even without consulting or involving relevant authorities in Tanzania. The respondent through the counter memorial has established with concrete evidence that the government actions towards regulating mining, mining sector in 2017 were justifiable. Following the alleged measures in 2017, now Tanzania is in agreement with the many foreign mining companies which are operating in Tanzania under new terms. For example, the deal between Tanzania and the Bulk Gold Corporation was signed in 2020 even before filing of the, of the notification of this arbitration case. Therefore, the contention that Tanzania through new registration of 2017 did not target. Therefore, this suggested that the Tanzania amendment of 2017 did not target foreign investors. Since the claimants claims should be ignored for being devoid of any legal basis. Introduction of the new registration at the beginning of July 2017 did not at all result in a complete of all of Tanzania mining regime as alleged. The historical and economical justification for changes is well elaborated in the counter memorial in detail. The measures were taken as regulatory changes of police and law as by the existing legal framework, both domestically and internationally. The removal of the legislative basis for SMP retention license was well explained to all stakeholders through their representative. The purpose of, these, of those measures was not to, prop, to expropriate the claimant's assets, but to grant it the claimant an alternative minority over the project area. The amending legislation did not prevent area from realizing its investment in Tanzania as alleged. Even if the retention license were abolished in law, the said abolition was not per se an act to acquire the project subject to the retention license. The claimant had not been able to identify through its own memorial any investor who was assigned to operate in the alleged areas covered by the retention license. To the contrary, we invited for an alternative arrangement 
Following abolition of retention license, the claimant refused or neglected to meet the respondents. Tanzania has established in the counter memorial and the other pleadings that it has not expropriated the claimant investment, either through amending legislation of 2017 and its regulation of 2018, or the alleged invited in, tender in December 2019. In the circumstances, therefore, the claimant's claim for compensation is without any merit, thus must fail. The alleged tender published on, 20, on 19 December 2019 through many commission website could not in any material respect be regarded as an act of expropriation as none of the alleged project areas were awarded to any investor. The change of status of retention license through the law without any direct or indirect loss of control of the mining area does not amount to nationalization or expropriation of an investment. All investors who owned the retention license were invited to enter into new arrangement with the government of Tanzania, and some of the said investors are still operating in Tanzania as partners with the government in the mining sector. These investors, including Kabanga Nico and the Precious Metal, that is finishing its application for mining license. The respondents submit that Tanzania is a sovereign state and is independent. And it has been pursuing various policy and regulatory measures to reform its mineral sector in order to make the industry favorable to all stakeholders involved. These measures cannot be considered as equivalent to disregarding an international agreement or violation of Tanzania obligation under the BIT. That all action taken by Tanzania in enforcement of mining laws and the other regulation relating to the mining legal framework were within context of the Constitution of the United Republic of Tanzania, relevant policies in the legal frameworks of Tanzania. The ultimate goals of government always been to realize optimal value out of mineral sector that will immensely contribute to the national economy and improve livelihoods of Tanzanian citizens. As a sovereign state, the respondent is at liberty to enact laws through due process when there are changes in the political, social, and economic environment as long as the laws are not discriminatory. This has been ruled in the arbitration case of Methanex Corporation in the United States of America where it was held that as a matter of general international law, a non-discriminatory regulation for public purpose, which is enacted in accordance with the due process and which affects entirely a foreign investor or investment, is not deemed expropriatory and compensable unless a specific commitment had been given by the regulating government to any putative foreign investors contemplating investment that the government would refrain from such a regulation. As explained from the BTL shareholding structure, Winnie Share is not an investor through BTL. If there were any investment made in respect of the license granted to BTL, it is the LO or BHL and the BTL who ought to have claimed the alleged investment but not the claimant who has no right over the project in dispute. On the other end, LO and BTL, who are shareholders of BTL, are not a party of these arbitration proceedings. Article 1 of the BIT defines investor as a party or national of a party or an enterprise of a party that seeks to make or is making or has made an investment. Also, the term investment of an investor is defined to mean an investment owned or controlled directly or indirectly by an investor of such a part. Further, Article 25 
of the ECD Convention vested the tribunal with the jurisdiction to entertain investment dispute between a host state and an investor. In this case, the claimant is not an investor and he did not make any investment in Tanzania through BTL as he alleged. Therefore, the claimant's claim of investment are contrary to the requirement of what go on of the BIT and the article 25 of the XCD convention. Thank you, Madam President. My, present my presentation will end here. Then I welcome my fellow to proceed with the next part of this opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Madam President and all members of the tribunal. I'll proceed where my colleague ended. A third point of defense of the respondent is that the respondent has never expropriated the claimant's investment as alleged. The claimant alleges that the respondent has, uh, has expropriated its investment through the 2017 amendments and the invitation to tender dated 19th and 20th December 2019 through the Mining Commission website. Here in under is the argument in relation to the 2017 amendments. Tanzania has established through the counter memorial rejoinder its witnesses statement and will establish during this oral hearing that it has never expropriated the claimant's investment either through amending legislation of 2017 and its regulations of 2018 or the alleged invita invitation to tender in December 2019. The respondent submit that the abolition of litigation license through the amendment of the Mining Act 2010 intended to serve public purpose. Even before the amendment and enactment the laws of the laws, the letting of the holding leisure license, the state declared that the purpose of these amendments was to address challenges to the mineral sector by threatening the administrative structure and reviewing the fiscal regime relating to this sector in order to achieve a win-win situation between investors and the, and the nation. This purpose was clearly explained during the legislative process of amending the enactment and enacting the mining law in paragraph 352 of the respondent's counter memorial. The respondent denies to have expropriated the investment of the claimants since expropriation is regarded as taking of property permanently belonging to a foreign investor by the state, which in this case at hand is not true, as all investors who owned the rotation license were invited to enter into a new arrangement with Tanzania and some of the investors are still operating in Tanzania as partners with the government in the mining sector. These investors include Kabanga Nickel and Precious Metal that is finalizing its application for mining license. Expropriation may not be illegal under international law if it is for a public purpose, non-discriminatory manner and in accordance with the due process. According to the doctrine of police powers, states are not liable to pay compensation when, in the normal exercise of their regulatory power, they adopt a non-discriminatory bona fide regulation that are aimed at general welfare such as public health or safety. Before considering any claim under the investment treaty or BIT, the tribunal have to always have 
always warned itself for not adopting a consecutive approach of ruling that expropriation was unlawful without analyzing the evidence to support the allegation by, a, by an investor that the state acted unlawfully to expropriate its assets. In this regard, the tribunal would consider, one, whether there was actual investment, two, whether the alleged investment is protected under any acceptable international treaty, three, whether the claimant is really investor covered under relevant BIT, four, whether the expropriation took place, and if yes, five, to what extent was an investor affected, and six, whether an investor is entitled for any compensation. In this case, the respondent will demonstrate that the alleged amendment of the written miscellaneous, of the miscellaneous law, miscellaneous amendment act 2017, amending legislation, were not, were done for the public interest, followed due process of law, and they are not discriminatory. Hence, it does not amount to expropriation. In relation to the alleged invitations uh, of the tender, as one of the ways uh, that uh, the claimants allege that we have expropriated this property for investment, the respondents is saying that the invitation to tender of December 2019 does not amount to expropriation. According to the claimants' claim, the third step of expropriation took place on 19th December 2019, where the state is alleged to put the areas previously covered by retention license, including the project area, up for the public tender. In alleging so, the claimants have thawed her breedings and the witnesses failed to establish actual state nationalization of the Sazama Kongoros project as purported. Tanzania states that the intention of the tender was to improve the mineral sector order to the government of Tanzania to attain legitimate power on the areas previously owned by the retention license holders. The invitation to tender of 2019 was to pre-qualify for the joint development of the areas formerly held under retention license, which was supposed to take the form of joint venture with Stamiko, with Stamiko. The invitation to tender contained no indication that this condition could be waived by the Mining Commission. Quite the contrary, the invitation to tender required interested bidders to comply with, this, with Section 10 of the Mining Act, Cap 1, 2, 3, on 16% free carry interest shares and agree to joint with Stabico for 20 to 30 percent shares, irrespectively of 16 percent government free carry interest. The respondent submits that Tanzania is a sovereign state and is independent. It has been pursuing various policies and regulatory measures to reform its mineral sector in order to make the industry favorable to all stakeholders involved. The measures cannot be considered as equivalent to disregarding an international agreement or violation of Tanzania's obligation under the BIT. Further, the respondent state that all actions taken by, the, by Tanzania in the enforcement of mining law and other regulations relating to the mining legal framework were within context of the Constitution of the United Public of Tanzania, relevant policies and the legal framework in, of Tanzania. The ultimate goal of the government has always been
to realize optimal value out of the mineral sector that will immensely contribute to the national economy and improve livelihood of Tanzanian citizens. Therefore, there was no any expropriation either by the date of authorization of the law or publication of the invitation to tender. And this is detailed also in paragraph 33 of uh, respondents' counter memorial. The respondent submits that the tender dated 19th December 2019 was open to any interested bidder, including the claimant. The claimant through its subsidiary, BTL, was el eligible for such application. The invitation to tender of 19th December 2019 had an item of compensation from the successful winner to compensate the previous owner of the retention license holders. However, after further analysis, it was in the view of the government that it would be difficult for divisions negotiation on the aspect of compensation without the intervention of the government. Following the observation of the government on that aspect, the tender of 19th December 2019 was, was replaced by another tender of 20th December 2019, which in its nature removed the aspect of compensation with the aim of putting areas under the control of the government to regulate the issues of compensation for the betterment of the procedure in acquisition of the areas on those areas. However, before the government mechanisms for the compensation was achieved, the claimants, the claimant filed the claim to exceed hence this dispute. The alleged invitation to for tender in all material aspects was neither expropriation nor the tender had reached an end to amount violation of the BIT or any other international customary law. The claimant is invited for an alternative arrangement following cancellation of detention licenses. However, the claimant refused or neglected to comply with the directives of the respondents. Therefore, Tanzania did not expropriate the claimant's project to amount to the breach of the BIT. Another point, which is the fourth point of the respondent's defense, is in relation to the amendment of 2017 by the respondent it, that it was not discriminatory. The respondent states that the amendment of 2017 to the Mining Act 2010 were non-discriminatory, as they are not intended to, to discriminate subpersons in isolation of and or discriminating others. Rather, they are made to ensure effective utilization of natural resources to all citizens and non-citizens of Tanzania. The council licenses belonged to both foreign and domestic investors. The amendments were rather general and applied to all former retention license holders, regardless of their nationality. For instance, retention license number RL0013-2014 held by, Tan by a Tanzanian majority owned company, Precious Metal Refinery Company Limited, was also among the canceled retention licenses. The respondents state that Tanzania, through new legislation of July 2017, did not target foreign investors. The measures were taken as regulatory changes of police and law as per the existing legal framework both domestically and internationally. The removal of the legislative basis for the Sazama Kongorosi project licenses was well explained to all stakeholders, including the claimants through, the, through, the, through her representative. 
Therefore, there were no discrimination as it was defined in the decision above. The respondent states that the amending to the Mining Act 2010, made in 2017, and the enactment of the Mining Mineral Rights Regulations of 2018 were non-discriminatory in nature and did not target the claimants or foreign investors as claimed by the claimant. In order for a measure to amount to discrimination, a case must be treated differently from, the, uh, from other cases of a similar nature. The amendments were rather general applied, and applied to all former retention license holders, regardless their nationality. The government aimed at ensuring the endowed mineral resources of the country benefit both the country and the investor, investors in a win-win situation. This goes in line with the correct payment of royalties and other taxes. Further, the allegation that the respondent did not disclose the purpose of the cancellation of retention license is baseless. The reasons for amending the legislation were specified in the bill for amendment of the said laws as the usual process of enactment and, en and amendment of laws by the parliament. The respondents insist that the amending legislation were implemented to pursue a public purpose, ensuring that the people of Tanzania benefit from their natural wealth and resources. In recognizing of this right, the respondent invited the claimant to apply for mining or special mining license in the same area that were held under the retention licenses. The respondent submit that following the amendment of Mining Act in 2017, now Tanzania is, an, is in agreement with other many foreign mining companies who are operating in Tanzania under the new terms. For example, the deal between Tanzania and Barrick Gold Corporation was signed in 2020. Even before the agreement filed these proceedings, arbitral proceedings. This suggests that the requirement argument that Tanzania government targeted foreign investors, including Akashia, is misleading and unjustifiable, taking into, cons to, into account that Indian resources taking into account that there are other investors who are still operating in Tanzania in the, in, in the mining sector. In the case of Joseph Charles Remire versus Ukraine, number 11206, the tribunal defined discrimination as, in the words of pertinent President requires more than different treatment to amount to discrimination. A case must be treated differently from similar cases without justification. A measure must be discriminatory and exposes the claimants to sectional or racial prejudice. Or a measure must target claimants' investments specifically as a foreign investment. investment. The tribunal note that from the outset, the laws have never targeted individual company or entity. The law operates to all natural wealth and resources extending from petroleum to mineral companies. Besides, in the United Public of Tanzania, there are a number of companies currently operating comfortably within the alleged three pieces of legislation without any complaint. The fifth defense regarding the process of expropriation of the claimants 
investment has alleged that they responded rejected its position that the due process of law was observed. The respondent submit that the 2017 amendments were done in accordance with the due process of the law as all the stakeholders involved in the mineral sector were consulted through the government public notice issued by the Tanzanian parliament on 19th June 2017 and they were given time to express their opinion accordingly. The process was transparent and consistent. In that regard, Tanzania accorded the claimants in alleged investment fair and equitable treatment. Tanzania neither frustrated the claimants' legitimate expectation nor discriminated the claimants, the claimants since in a regulatory framework such as that in Tanzania, in force, in force in Tanzania, where there has been several changes of policy and the legal framework in the mineral sector, it is unreasonable to, to assume that the laws will remain unchanged. In any event, as a sovereign state, like any other state in the world, Tanzania is at liberty to enact laws when there are challenges in its political, social, and economic environment. As such, the claimant allegations against the 2017 law are without justification, and so it's stopped from challenging the validity or otherwise applicability of the new laws. This has been this has been this position has been given in a case of Methanex Corporation and the USA, which has been discussed a few minutes ago. I will not go to that. But what the respondents says or states is that procedure for amending and enacting the new Mining Act and the regulations respectively was done in accordance with the due process of law. In Tanzania, the power of parliament to legislate is vested under Article 97 of the Constitution of the United Public of Tanzania. Under the Tanzania Parliament Standing Orders, there are three ways to introduce bill in the Parliament before it is enacted into law. The first is provided under Order 80 of the Standing Orders, which requires the publication of the bill at least twice in the government gazette. The first government notice is supposed to be issued to the clerk of the National Assembly in not less than 21 days before the first reading of such bill is in the parliament. The second process dispenses with the requirement of the 21 days rule and the bill is submitted under the Certificate of Agents in accordance with Order 80, Sub 4 of the Standing Orders. And the last process is relating to money bills governed under the Part, part 9 of the Standing Orders. It is the respondent's submission that the 2017 Amendment to the Mining Act 2010 was under emergency procedure, under certificate of urgency, in other words. In regard, the amendment of the legislation followed this procedure. Standing orders number 84, sub 4, uh, provide that bill together with a document by president starting the bill referred to 
in the document is referring the document is of an agency are incorporated in the business of the parliament. But again, standing order number eight, sub five, require that bill is submitted to the steering committee accompanied by the emergency document so that the committee may determine whether the relevant bill is to be submitted as a matter of urgency or not. You go further, the process require that once considered that the bill is of urgency, the bill is introduced in the National Assembly and the clerk of the National Assembly will set the bill on the order paper and therefore a bill becomes an agenda of the day. Standing order number 83-1, therefore, requires that the bill goes for first reading in which the clerk reads only the short title without allowing discussion on the bill. Again, standing order number 3084-1 requires that the bill is tabled for the first reading, then the speaker will refer to it to the appropriate committee, usually according to its thematic area. The committee shall deal with, the, with it as expeditiously as possible on behalf of all members of the parliament. Standing order number 85 requires that after the committee completes its deliberations on the bill, the chairperson of the committee notify the speaker in writing that the committee has completed the discussion of the bill. Then the speaker directs the bill be placed on the list of activities of the second reading. Standing order number 86, five require that the bill be submitted to the parliament for the second reading, the permanent, the chairperson of the committee to whom the bill has been referred or the other member of the committee appointed for the purpose shall give the committee an opinion on the bill concentrated with the debate during the second reading and shall be limited to the quality and the principles of the bill. It's from this process of enacting and amending legislation in Tanzania, the respondents submit that the amendments were done in accordance with the, the second way of introducing the bill in the parliament which waived the 21-day rules. The respondent submit in any way neither violated the conditions and the, the, through the pleadings, through the pleadings, the respondent insist that the claimants was presented by the Tanzania Chamber of Mineral and Energy, TCME, representing mining sectors, mining investors, interest by acting as an umbrella body of all medium and large scale mining in exploration in Tanzania. As they always represent them in all collective dialogue with the government. After all, all the stakeholders were notified through parliament, parliamentary website. The purpose or objective of the amending legislation were well stated in the long title of the relevant bill for the enactment of the law. 
there was nowhere in the bill of the law it was stated that the law were intended to target foreign mining companies, nor does the Kremlin provide adequate support for its position to the contrary, preparing instead to speculate with regard to what it believes as was well intended rather than focus on the actual language of the bill or the alleged amending legislation. Indeed, in these circumstances, to impose such frictious requirement of violation of BIT and exit convention on this case would not only be inappropriate, but would also set a dangerous precedent for future investment cases. The respondents submit in any way neither violated the conditions under Sazama Kongoros project retention license, nor obligations of Tanzania under any international law. Tanzania being a sovereign state had to pursue some regulatory measures to reform its mining industry in order to enable all investors in the extractive industry sector to equally benefit with the available resources. The abolition of the retention license was done in good faith and for the public interest without discrimination and in accordance of the due process as shown above. It is therefore submitted that the respondent should be should not be liable to pay compensation to the claimant under the police powers doctrine. Further, the respondent invited all investors who owned retention licenses to enter into a new arrangement with Tanzania, whereby some of the said investors responded, resp who responded are still operating in Tanzania as partners with the government in the mining sector. The respondent will demonstrate through this hearing that Cremant were throughout operations did not have any feasibility study to make their alleged expropriation come to the mining stage, hence entitled to the claimed amount in this proceedings. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm done. Thank you. No, no, you, you can finish. To my part, yeah, to my course. part, I'm, I'm done, yes. Off. Yeah, so I was about to invite the leading council to proceed. So you are finished with your part now? Yes. Fine, then this is a good time to take a 15-minute break. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good, can we resume? Yes, yes, good. So Dr. Luende, I don't know whether you're the next to take the floor. Yes, I, I am, yeah. Madam so President. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Madam President and the honorable members of the tribunal. I'm taking over from where my colleagues ended in which submission the respondent has maintained consistently that uh, the claimant is not entitled to any compensation. However, as we indicated in our summary of issues, that in the event the tribunal finds that the claimant had made an investment in Tanzania, and that that investment was expropriated, it is the respondent's submission that uh, the claimant is not entitled to the compensation claimed, which is Canadian dollars, 100 
and 24.78 million, which is made of 116.2 uh, million and pre-award interest of Canadian dollars uh, 8.58 million as claimed because that claim of compensation is unjustifiable for lack of merit and that uh, the claimant have used a wrong valuation approach to reach to the said amount of compensation claimed. The alleged loss of 124 million point seven eight Canadian dollars as a fair market value of the uh, 116.2 million Canadian dollars and the pre-award interest of 8.5 million as per uh, Vicky report one witness uh, expert report one claimed suffered by the claimant as investment cost and the cost of return associated with the project uh, lacks any proof to substantiate actual investment or loss. In doing so, we have also demonstrated that uh, there was no any record to show a flow of capital from Canada to Tanzania directly or through the locally incorporated Buffex Tanzania Limited, uh, uh, abbreviated BTL. Honorable Madam President and members, let me recap on the valuation approach uh, used by the claimant in reaching to this claimed amount of compensation. The respondent has stated that according to International Valuation Standard uh, 105 uh, valuation approaches and methods, there are basically three main approaches used in evaluation. And this, even the claimant have not disputed that, so there is no dispute about these approaches. The market approach, the income approach, and the cost approach. For the purposes of this case, there is a divergency between the claimant and the respondent. It is the respondent uh, submission that the most appropriate uh, method of valuation is the market <coughs> approach. While the claimant maintains that the uh, proper valuation method is the cost approach. Now, briefly, uh, about the market approach, this provides an indication of value by comparing the asset or company with the identical or comparable, uh, that is a, a similar asset for which price information is readily available. I will repeat that, that the market approach provides an indication of value by comparing the asset or company with the identical or comparable asset for which price information is readily available. So we underline the word readily available and it will show in our submission that already there was price information with regard to wind share in Tanzania, and that should be used as the benchmark for this uh, market approach. So the information in the market approach uh, taken in, uh, into account for valuation purposes usually include identical or similar businesses, uh, business ownership interest, and securities exchanged in the market and any relevant transactions of shares in the same business prior to the transactions or offers in question. 
the market approach is based on an and, uh, underlying theme that the wider market has already done the work of valuing companies and businesses of all kinds using all the available information. So the valuer's role under this approach is to find a quoted company or a company that has been sold that is the same as the company being valued and then use its quoted valuation or rather the sale price as the basis of value of the subject company. The information taken into account for valuation purposes includes similar businesses, uh, business ownership, and securities exchanged in market. So reference here is made to section 20 of the IVS 105 general standards, which uh, defines the market approach as I have defined above. The market approach is recommended under the following circumstances. The first is that the subject asset has recently been sold in a transaction appropriate for consideration under the basis of value. Number two, the subject asset or substantially similar asset are actively publicly traded and there are frequent or recent observable transactions in substantially similar assets. Therefore, under this approach, the critical element affecting the value of the asset is the price it would achieve in a market rather than the cost of reproduction or its income producing ability. There are three valuation methods under the market approach, which are, one, the comparable transactions method, also known as guideline transaction method, and number two is the share transaction method, or it's also referred to as direct market evidence of asset value, and number three is market capitalization. Now, by way of recap with regard to cost approach, is that the historical cost approach or the cost approach provides an indication of value using the economic principle that the buyer will pay no more value for an asset than the cost to obtain an asset of equal utility, whether by purchase or by construction, unless in due time, inconvenience, risk, or other factors are involved. The cost approach provides an indication of value by calculating the current replacement or reproduction cost of an asset and making deductions for physical deterioration and all other forms of obsolescence. The cost approach should be applied and be afforded significant weight under the following circumstances. One, the participants would be able to recreate an asset with substantially the same utility as the subject asset without regulatory or legal restrictions. And the asset could be recreated quickly enough that a participant would be willing to pay a significant premium for the ability to use the asset immediately. Number two, the asset is not directly income generating and the unique nature of the asset makes using an income approach or market approach 
unfeasible. And finally, the basis of value being used is fundamentally based on replacement cost, such as replacement value. Now, under the valuation, under the cost approach, there are three valuation methods. The first one is the replacement cost method, which indicates the value by calculating cost of a similar asset, offering equivalent utility. The second is the reproduction cost method, a method under the cost that indicates the value by calculating the cost of recreating a replica of an asset. And finally, the summation method, which calculates the value of an asset by the addition of the separate values of its component parts. Madam President and members, in the circumstances where business is valued using a cost approach, valuers should follow the requirements of IVS 105, Valuation Approaches and Methods, Sections 70 and 8. 70 and 80. It is the respondent submission that no one valuation method is suitable in every possible situation. Therefore, the following factors need to be considered in selecting the most appropriate valuation approaches and methods for an asset under the particular circumstances. One, the appropriate basis or basis of the value. And the premises of value determined by the terms and purpose of valuation assignment. Two, the respective strengths and weaknesses of the possible valuation approaches and methods. Three, the appropriateness of each method in a view of the nature of the asset and the approaches or methods used by the participants in the relevant market. And finally, the availability of reliable information needed to apply the method. Therefore, the choice of valuation methods depends on a number of factors, including the nature of business being valued, the availability of reasonably reliable financial information, and the existence of a market for similar or comparable companies or assets. It is the respondent's submission that the cost approach is not appropriate in this case for the reasons that I will elaborate shortly. It is the respondent's submission that given the stage of development at the SMP mineral property at the alleged valuation date, the cost approach is not the best approach. And if used, it will result in overly speculative market value for purposes of compensation. This analysis by the respondent stems from results of thorough analysis of WinShare's regulatory filings on SEDAW database since its incorporation in the year 1999. Furthermore, the company's track record and that of its directors, shareholders, affiliates supports that 
Windshare is not entitled to return on investment or return <coughs> on costs for costs incurred on the SMP, Sasa Makongros project, as it would result in the awarding of unfair and overly speculative damages. This fact applies to the extractive industry and especially in the exploration projects where considerable portion of the incurred costs at early project stages are usually sunk <coughs> or sunk costs. As they are not in any way related to the determination of any feasible project in the end. That unlike non extractive projects, the irreversibility of costs incurred in exploration of mineral properties is based on the specific characteristics of the properties, which are site specific and takes into account the remoteness of the project. Exploration of mineral properties involves drilling, sample extraction, and preparation that are specific to the project site and they are not transferable. Given the fact that SMP gold projects fits the characteristics of a mineral resource property, then a large portion of exploration costs incurred on the project were sunk costs. And therefore, subject to substantially low salvage value upon the expiry of the retention licenses, which was otherwise due within two years. The claimant's demand for damages amounting to 124 0.7 million Canadian dollars as of June 30th, 2021 is hypothetical, highly exaggerated, and ultimately groundless for the following reasons. One, the claimant's valuer has deliberately applied in appropriate valuation approach. That is the historical cost approach. Here, reference is made to Vic War Report 1, paragraph 4.3.18, to establish an, an unauthenticated cost base to which she then arbitrarily determined and applied a subjective compounded return on cost of 10% to grossly inflate the quantum of damages. And here we are making reference to uh, Vic War report, the first report, paragraph 4.3, 20, and 4.3, 22. Madam President and the Honorable Members, the second point is that the nature of the retention license was that the retention license was granted to a company called BTL, which was incorporated in Tanzania. Therefore, this was the right entity if the claimant wanted to establish the historical cost, the appropriate entity to establish such historical cost would have been BTL. BTL was under obligations in Tanzania, number one, to file quarterly reports of its operations in Tanzania, and number two, preparation of audited financial statements.
Now, for the reasons best known to the claimants and the claimant's valuer, they have ignored to take into account the audited financials of Buffett Tanzania, the entity which was the license holder of the retention licenses in question, which are a subject of this dispute. But only that, my colleagues have also submitted that Buffex, even its officials, have never been made part of these proceedings. Now, what is the issue the respondent takes with this deliberate omission of Buffex Tanzania Limited? We have gone through the audited financials of Buffex Tanzania, which have been submitted by the claimants, but never used by the uh, valuer, by the uh, claimants. Now, in the interest of time, I will just mention that we have gone through the records of Buffex Tanzania for the years from uh, 2007 to the year 2018. Now, here, I'm making reference to Exhibit C 397, Exhibit C 391, Exhibit C 392, Exhibit C 393, Exhibit C 394, Exhibit C 395, Exhibit C 398, Exhibit C 399, Exhibit 400, Exhibit 325, Exhibit uh, uh, C 401, and finally Exhibit C 402. These were the audited financials of Buffex Tanzania Limited, the license holder. And what we have established is that based on those audited financials, the claimant, through uh, its alleged uh, subsidiary in Tanzania, had <coughs> spent 42 billion point seven Tanzanian shillings. 42.7 Tanzanian shillings. That is the amount which has been spent by Buffex Tanzania from the year 2007 to the year 2018. And if that amount is converted today, we are not saying that would be the right uh, method to do, but uh, to be the equivalent of 20.3 uh, 20, 20 million Canadian dollars. So it is our submission that if we had, the claimant had wanted to establish a uh, historical cost then the most appropriate base was the audited financials of Buffex Tanzania Limited, a company that was operating in Tanzania, but also the license holder in this regard. Now, but also the claimant's valuer have also rejected, despite the fact that she has submitted evidence of those quarterly reports showing also how much was spent in Tanzania. But those reports, quarterly reports which are submitted pursuant to the requirement of law were never used in the valuation exercise. It is also our submission that if the claimant wanted to establish the overhead cost, the most appropriate source of how much money ought to have been spent or were spent on overhead cost, the same could have been derived from the audited financial statements of Buffex Tanzania Limited. But unfortunately, it is not the case here. It's not the case. It's not the case. 
But not only that, something else that we have also noted is that in the calculation of historical cost, the claimant's expert, the valuer, has rejected the fact that the claimant, apart from having four retention licenses, which are allegedly been canceled, the claimant also had other nine prospecting licenses in Tanzania. And this, this can also be seen in several of the claimant's documents, including uh, Vic Wall report, paragraph, uh, uh, the first report, paragraph 233, uh, three, but also exhibit uh, 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 VW 2.3. Now, if the claimed compensation relates to the retention license, a reasonable observer would have expected that the valuer to exclude those costs which do not relate to the retention license. Now, going through the report, there is no such exclusion. And this means now, and it supports the respondent's assertion, that the historical cost used by uh, the valuer has been exaggerated because did not take into account those factors which we have included, we have included. The other point that we have taken issues with the claimant's valuation is the authenticity of the source documents. The claimant in their submissions and in their pleadings have failed to provide proof of the costs actually incurred under the area in dispute, which is 48 kilometer square portion of the total area of 238 square kilometers of the total area of the SMP. The claimant valuation expert also chose to rely on an authenticated and an audited interim consolidated financial statements of the parent company to allocate expenditures for the entire SMP project, including the areas under the nine prospecting licenses. We are making reference here to, for example, Vic War first report, paragraph uh, 5.32 to paragraph 5.33. Now, the respondent has also taken trouble to analyze those documents submitted. As I've said, none of the 52 financial statements that we have reviewed submitted by the respondent, none of the 52 financial statements came from Buffett, Tanzania, the license holder. All of them were based on the parent company. Now, we have also noted that all the 13 audited annual financial statements used in calculation do not bear the name or signature of the auditing firm's signatory. And here we have made reference to uh, several documents, VW 5.7, <coughs> VW 5.11, VW 5.15, 
VW 5.19, VW 5.23, VW 5.27, VW 5.31, VW 5.35, VW 5.39, VW uh, 5.43, VW 5.47, VW 5.51, and finally VW 5.55. The other anomaly that we have noted is that 21 out of the 52 financial statements used to calculate cost incurred, which is equivalent to over 40% of the statements used to calculate 30% of the total exploration cost. Here uh, I'm making reference to uh, Vic War Report Paragraph uh, 3.38. And then uh, 5.46, 5.47, 5.48, 5.49, 5.50, 5.51, 5.52, 5.53, 5.54, 5.55, 5.56, 5.57, 5.58, 5.59, 5.60, 5.61, 5.62, 5.63, 5.64, 5.65, 5.66, 5.67, 5.68, 
for the serious claim like this, that figure can, cannot be used to make a determination. We have also noted that the claimant's valuation expert has falsely interpreted the guideline titled Applying the Cost Approach to Valuation of Exploration uh, Stage Mineral Assets. Here, I'm making reference to Vic, uh, Vic War report, uh, the first report, paragraph 4, uh, 4.320, to 4.321, page 23, and exhibit VW 4.5, by claiming that the concept of a return on investment is consistent conceptually with another method of assessing the fair, val the fair market value of mines at an early stage namely the multiple of exploration expenditure. Furthermore, the claimant has intentionally chose to wrongly apply a compounded return on cost of 10% per annum. Here, we are making reference to a VQO report, the first report, paragraph 6.11, 6.24, 6.28, and 6.210 on page 39 to 49 of that report. Also, we are making reference to Vic Wall Appendix VWG. This, according to the respondent, is the speculative attempt which has resulted to more than double the amount of claim from the calculated cost base of 46.5 million Canadian dollars to a total claim of 116.2 before interest, an increase of almost Canadian dollars uh, 69.6 million. Uh, here we are making reference to Vic uh, War Report, the first report, paragraph 3.44, and table 3.1 at page 7, sorry, at page 17 of the report. Madam President and members, we have also noted with the concern that the claimant indicates in his memorial that there are several shareholders in WinShare, including the International Finance Corporation, IFC, which at a time held about 15% shares and contributed to the project, contributed to the project around 7.9 million Canadian dollars. And this can be found under paragraphs uh, 116 and paragraphs, the paragraph 121 of the claimant's memorial, the claimant's memorial. IFC as a shareholder who contributed. But there is also another remarkable shareholder also introduced under paragraph 121 of the memorial. And this is the Canadian Bank Scotia Capital Inc., or simply referred to as Scotia, which had invested Canadian dollars 10 million. However, in their submissions, in their pleadings and exhibits, the claimant has not shown any proof that the said shareholders 
IFC and Scotia have authorized the claimants to sue on their behalf or they have an agreement that the compensation claimed in this arbitration will be shared with those uh, big shareholders of the claimants. We have also noted another anomaly that the claimant has intentionally left out Bafex Tanzania Limited, which was the holder of the retention license in question, and actually the operating entity in Tanzania. From these proceedings, it is the respondent's submission that such omission of Bafex Tanzania Limited has the intention of evading or avoiding financial obligations in Tanzania, including tax liabilities established against Bafex Tanzania. And here, the, the issue of tax liability, I'm making reference to paragraph 25 of the second witness statement of Richard Williams, which admits that Bafex Tanzania Limited has a tax liability of Tanzanian shillings 100,942 uh, million. It means if the claimant were to be successful in these proceedings, then that tax liability and the other claims by uh, BTL uh, partners in Tanzania will never, never be paid. Now, moving further to the respondent's submission about the correct valuation method. It is the respondent's submission that the market approach, given the circumstances of this transaction, which I will explore shortly, is the appropriate evaluation method. Although the respondent admits that no one approach or method is applicable in all circumstances, in all three valuation approaches, it is highly recommended to maximize the use of relevant observable market information, price information from an active market is generally considered to be the strongest evidence of value. The comparable transaction method under the market approach, also known as the guideline transactions method, utilizes information on transactions involving assets that are the same or similar to the subject asset to arrive at an indication value. When the comparable transactions considered involve the subject asset, this method is sometimes referred to as the prior or precedent transaction method. The method includes consideration of listings or offers to buy more weight when an offer represents a binding commitment to purchase or sell an asset at a given time. The factors considered under this approach include the nature of the business being valued, the availability, including the reliable financial information, three, the existence of a market for similar comparable uh, companies and the timing of the transaction. Some bases of value may prohibit a valuer from making subjective adjustment to price information from 
active market. Therefore, the most preferred method to establish the fair market value of a publicly traded asset is to determine the market value of its shares. The price pay, paid by an investor for a share in an arms length transaction shortly before the interference with the investment is likewise a liable evidence of the fair market value of an asset. Although the tribunals sometimes rely on costs incurred, that is to say, investment made in the project or book value to determine fair compensation, incurred costs are in some specific circumstances, like ours, they have a tendency to overestimate the real value of an asset or investment of the project. Now, we come back to Hirio Shantagod Arrangement Agreement of 2017. It is not in dispute that on 19th June 2017, just 15 days before the enactment of the 27 amendments to the Mining Act, which is the cause of this dispute, Helio Resources, which is now known as Windshare and Shanta Limited, entered into an agreement pursuant to which Shanta would acquire all the issued and outstanding common shares of Helio Resources in exchange of 59.5 million Shanta shares worth approximately British pound 4.32 million, which is equivalent to Canadian dollars 7.28 million. The respondent clearly emphasized that the most appropriate approach for assessing fair market value of the SMP at the valuation date without awarding unfair and overly speculative damages to windshare is the market approach, which is also known as identical share uh, precedent transaction method adjusted at the valuation date. As demonstrated by our witness, Mr. Mwankakala, the use of this market approach would value the claimants, would value the claimant uh, project for purposes of compensation at Canadian dollars 9.53 million plus pre-award interest. Now, in its submission, the, the respondent, the claimant has indicated that the transaction uh, between uh, Hirio by then and Shanta was not at arm's length, but also the transaction could not go through as expected because of the amendments undertaken by the respondent. This information is not correct. I will demonstrate by having a look at one of the uh, claimant's press releases, ARA 30. Okay, can we see? Whereby this is a exhibit ARA 30. R three 
Now, you would see clearly that the claimants indicated that they did not agree with Shanta alleged reasons for termination. And this press release quotes Richard Williams, who is also a witness in these proceedings, saying, I quote, we strongly disagree with Shanta's gold assertion that the recent changes to Tanzania's mining laws amount to a material adverse effect as defined in the arrangement agreement and reject their opportunistic attempt to walk away from their obligation. And in another, in another submission by the claimants, they actually indicated their intention to take legal measures against Shanta. Now, one will wonder if this transaction was to the disadvantage of the claimant, why on earth would the claimant come publicly and still want to be part of that transaction? So this is a clear indication that the claimant was ready to party company with their alleged investment in Tanzania at the price given by Shanta. Because even when Shanta wanted to pull out, the claimant, by their own words, they wanted them to respect the agreement. So with the benefit of hindsight, I would say, if Shanta had paid as agreed in the agreement, we would not have been here with this uh, dispute. So it is our submission that if the claimant was ready to part ways with their property just before the enactment of the alleged offending legislation at an amount of around $7.2 million, Canadian dollars. Now, at the time of compensation, miraculously, the claimant is claiming 124 Canadian dollars before interest. This is really amazing. And it's the first time in my 15 years of practice to see how that the, the amount can change within that period of two years. But that is the, the, claimant's, uh, the claimant's claim, the claimant's claim. And it is our submission that if they were ready to, to, to receive this from Shanta for purposes of compensation, they should also be ready to receive an amount of a similar nature as elaborated by our witness, Mr. Mwangakala. Now, there is also an issue of the valuation date, issue of valuation date. It is the respondent's submission that uh, the choice of valuation date can have a significant impact on the amount of compensation. In cases of uh, law for expropriation, the valuation date is usually determined by the date of expropriation or the date before impending expropriation became public. Since public knowledge has immediate influence on the value. In the cases of unlawful expropriation or other breaches of treaty obligations, there are generally two, generally two possible valuation dates. The first is the date of the alleged breach. And the second is the date of the award in which the tribunal needs to determine 
depending on the circumstances of the case. Now, we have a scenario that has been presented by the claimants. So when was the claimant's investment allegedly expropriated by the respondents? Is it on the date when the Mining Act was amended in 2017? Is it the time when the mining, mining mineral rights regulations in 2018 when were published? Or is it when the tender was published? In this regard, the respondent submits that the appropriate evaluation date should be, in this case, the 10th of January, 2018, when the mining mineral rights regulations were published with the effect of reverting all the areas under detention licenses to the government. That should be the valuation date. That should be the valuation date. Another point that I would like to address this tribunal with regards to appropriate adjustments. Appropriate adjustments. The respondent submits that the most accurate method of calculating a fair market value of the property is the share transaction method adjusted at the valuation date. The appropriate adjustment include capital appreciation and dividends paid to Shanta shareholders between the Herio Shanta transaction date, that is uh, 19th June 2017, and the valuation date allegedly of uh, 10th January 2018. During this period, Shanta did not pay any dividend to its shareholders. There is also an issue of pre- and post-award interest. The claimant claims for pre- and post-award interest on any amount awarded by, to it by the tribunal. The claimant quotes Article 10, sub-Article 3 of the Tanzanian Canada uh, BIT which provides, Article 10, sub Article 3, which provides compensation shall be payable in a freely convertible currency and shall include interest at a commercial reasonable rate for that currency. Now, the BIT, unfortunately, does not provide as to what amounts to interest at a commercially reasonable rate. But the claimants alleges that the Canadian prime rate of plus 2% is an appropriate rate for pre-award interest, and it reflects a commercial reasonable rate. Furthermore, the claimant argued that it is commercially reasonable to compound interest on a quarterly basis until the date of the award. And here, I'm making reference, specific reference to a page, to paragraph 369. Yes, to paragraph uh, uh, 369 of the claimant's uh, memorial. It is the respondent's submission as stipulated through its pleadings and will demonstrate in this hearing that it strongly disputes the claimant's position on the ground that there is no breach committed by the res respondent to entitle the claimant to any of the damages claimed. In the alternative, and only in circumstances that 
the tribunal rules out that there was investment by the claimants, and that investment has been expropriated, the respondent states that the tribunal to consider 10th January 2018 as the valuation date for calculation of interest instead of the December 2019 claimed by the claimants. Even though the through Canadian prime rate plus 2% margin is appropriate rate for pre-award, the same should not be compounded, but rather the use of simple interest is the most appropriate. The quarterly basis calculation of interest on the higher side, sorry, the quarterly basis calculation of interest is on the higher side and is not supported by any of the legal authorities provided by the claimants. As a common trend through various awards, the tribunal in awarding post-award interest should grant a grace period of 24 months to the claimants. The respondent wishes to expound these arguments as follows. One, the award of compound interest is not consistently recognized by international practice. Unlike what is claimed by the claimants, it is the respondent's submission that the award of compound interest as an item of compensation or damages is not unanimously recognized in international practices. From the exhibits cited by the claimant, a CLA uh, 94, from paragraphs, uh, uh, paragraph uh, 6237 to paragraph 6.242, uh, the author of this authority quoting from various jurisdictions, has highlighted different awards from various tribunals that have awarded simple interest. In summary, the tribunal considered the following factors in awarding interest. In the case of Utopista, Canchonada uh, versus Venezuela, the tribunal examined the possibility of awarding compound interest on the basis of an agreement by the parties, national law, or international law. After noting that the parties had no agreement or the national law was ambiguous, the tribunal awarded simple interest and stated that there is no well-established principle of international law requiring the award of compound interest. In another case of CSOB versus Slovak Republic, the tribunal again rejected the claim for compound interest as the claimant had not provided sufficient evidence that the compounding of interest was generally acceptable practice. In another case of CMS versus Argentina, the tribunal awarded simple interest due to its appropriateness. It is the respondent's submission that as opined by Ms. Wall and depleted by the claimant, Compound interest as an item of compensation or damages is not unanimously recognized in international practice. As is stated in CL 94, CLA 94, just cited, the reasons 
is the incoherent practice of banks regarding compounding and the compounding intervals. Furthermore, the fact that interest is usually compounded is not sufficient for the International Tribunal to accept, to accept it in their word. And in this case, the Tribunal should not award uh, compound interest. The function of post-award interest is best served if the Tribunal sets a time limit for the respondent to comply with the award, that's what we term as the grace period. Only after this limit, the post-award interest starts accruing. The respondent prays in, in this case that the tribunal deems it fit to grant post-award interest. The same should be granted with a grace period of 24 months so as to act as an incentive of expedient compliance with the award. And this position by the respondent is supported by the tribunal, by the tribunal, by the tribunal in the decision of Wema Hotels Limited versus Egypt and CMC versus Argentina, where the tribunal issued uh, grace period in which stopped the interest accrual and they allowed uh, free interest. As I'm about to finalize my, my submission, I wanted also to uh, uh, explain about the award of com compound interest that the reason why the respondent is uh, pleading before this tribunal that the interest should not be compounded. One of the reasons is that in all the pleadings submitted by the claimants, they have not indicated that their capital was loaned by the banks or they have any pending uh, loan from banks. So to use or to require the tribunal to use compound interest as the banking industries does would be unfair to, to the respondent, to the respondent. Madam President and members of the tribunal, after making our, our submission, now the respondent uh, prays that uh, this tribunal should uh, make the following orders and reliefs. One, a declaration that the United Republic of Tanzania, which is the respondent in this case, has not breached any obligation under Article 10, Articles 10 and 6 of the agreement between the government of Canada and the government of the United Republic of Tanzania, the BIT, for pro promotion and protection of investment. Two, a declaration that it is not, not any damage caused to and suffered by the, the claimant. Three, the claimant has failed to discharge the burden of proof that the measures taken by Tanzania are in a violation of various provisions of Tanzanian law, customary international law, or any provision of uh, the BIT. Should the tribunal find that the claimant had an investment in Tanzania, it should order that the amount of compensation given by to be given to the uh, claimant be as stated by the respondent's uh, witness, Mr. Mwangakala, and that should be the amount of Canadian dollars, 9.53 million uh, Canadian dollars. Oh, Madam President, after uh, making this submission, that marks the end of the
uh, respondents opening submission. So we, we remain at the tribunal's guidance on the next step. Thank you very much. I should have asked this when the document was on the screen, but you put a table on the screen showing the areas uh, that were subject to retention licenses and the areas that were not subject to retention licenses and the money invested in those areas. Can you direct me to that table, that chart that you put up? Is it in the record anywhere? Yes, it is. Can you just, just tell me where and I'll find it? <laughs> not it. It had the different areas. So it's a list of each of the different areas. That's it. What's the exhibit number on that? This the one? Yes. Okay. This is a VW 2.3. Sorry. It's a VW. This Excel sheet is a VW 2.3. DW 2.3. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Vic, Vic Wall, <laughs> expert Vic Wall. I'm, I'm sorry for that. But. Dr. Rwanda, I was looking for your um, request for relief in the rejoinder, and I was asking myself whether you meant to change that or you are repeat, simply restating it, because I'm not certain uh, you mentioned all the points. Yeah, I, I note in the request for relief in the rejoinder, paragraph 352, page 99, and then, well, it's actually 353 where the actual requests are. There's no request for declaration that the tribunal lacks jurisdiction or do I miss something? Sorry, uh, Madam President, J just a minute, but I, I've also uh, uh, missed the, the question. Mm -hmm. No, the, the question is, and now uh, in your oral uh, presentation, you uh, stated your request for relief. Mm -hmm. So my f question is, does this replace paragraph 353 or do you simply restate it, in we, which we, case we, 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 are, we are restating. This is the one that we need to rely on. So we, we oh, Madam President, we, we are not changing anything. Okay. We are just restating whatever is written in our pleadings. Thank no. you. Yes, or elaborating whatever is written in our pleadings. That's Good. what we do. And the second point was, I do not see in this request uh, 
declaration that the tribunal lacks jurisdiction. Is that on purpose? Or do I miss something? Um, Dr. Lohende, if I may help, you are looking at the wrong hearing bundle. You are looking at the Indiana hearing bundle we have been discussing <laughs> two weeks ago. <laughs> but, uh, but Madam President, th thank you. <laughs> now, what, what we can also do, if you don't want to uh, answer now on the spot, you could look at it and, and tell us tomorrow. That, that is fine. It will not change anything for us. So, so I, I think uh, I have created a, a kind of, uh, of confusion. I, I did not mean that we are, we are modifying our, our pleadings. That's fine. That's just clear the now. emphasis. So we are, we are not changing. And I think uh, the, the, the prayer on the issue of jurisdiction is found under paragraph four. Is it some, somewhere else? Yes, it is. It is. Uh, fine. Then, uh, then I look for it. should be repeated. Maybe maybe you have a look if after the hearing. Yeah, you give us some time. You, yes, you yes. Just give us the, the we appreciate direction. for that. Give and us I some time and well. then we'll, we'll come with the, the answer for that. Excellent. Is uh, there, uh, so we would like to thank you uh, on both sides for your uh, helpful presentations today. Is there anything, uh, I think, in consideration of the time, we will not start uh, the witness examination now because it's almost, uh, yeah, it's five o'clock, unless you think uh, we should be doing it. I mean, um, Madam President, we are in your hands. The only thing I would um, want to remind um, you is that tomorrow we have also Mr. Christopher McKenzie, who is testifying from London. Uh, so. Ideally, we would get a sense as to when that will be, irrespective of whether we start today or tomorrow with uh, Mr. Williams. Yeah. Uh, is there a specific time at which Mr. McKenzie is available? Oh, obviously, there's, Look, a six, there's a five-hour time difference, right? Yes, we will make him available whenever needed, but um, for but Planning not purposes, late at night. we yeah, would yeah. ideally know a little bit before when he should be there. And no, I think we should uh, we should agree on that. Um, do you have uh, an estimate, Dr. Luenda, for the time you will need for the cross examination of Mr. Williams? And that, of course, is not a commitment of yours. It's just an indication. Uh, Madam President, if you can allow me just a minute to confirm with my team. Sure. Thank you. Madam President, yes, after consultations with my colleagues here, uh, we, don't have, we don't intend to have a very long uh, cross-examination, but we think we'll be very safe if we have a maximum of three hours. That is the maximum of three hours. Mm -hmm. And do you have an estimate for Mr. McKenzie? 
I think Mackenzie, uh, we estimate to two hours will suffice. Mm -hmm. So for the two, uh, five hours, uh, that's the maximum. For. But that, of course, then we need to add, assume we take your maximum, because in my experience, it's, it's sometimes even more. Uh, and then we add direct, redirect breaks. Uh, would it be safer if we start now and go until 6 o'clock with Mr. Williams uh, if nobody has an objection against, uh, of course, his uh, cross-examination being uh, stopped today and him then uh, being sequestered? Because even if he's party representative, one he has take, once he has taken the stand, he should not communicate. Uh, then maybe that's safer because it will uh, avoid that tomorrow we are too pressed. Yes, um, Madam President, I think that's a good idea that we start today. It will obviously keep him sequestered overnight. Yeah. Uh, that's totally understood. I would just like to raise one point. I mean, with the um, time estimates, um, our friend opposite um, gave us, this would then only leave around one hour for the examination of Miss Wall. I mean, it's obviously up to the respondent to, um, you know, allocate the time as it sees fit, but I just want to make that clear that there are no surprises. Sorry, uh, Dr. Mac uh, can you please come again? Uh, we haven't heard uh, properly from you. No, if you consider that in total you have 9.5 hours today, six hours, 43 minutes left, does... time remaining for the parties is six hours and 55 minutes for the respondent and six hours and 43 minutes for the claimant. Yes, so you have to consider that in these remaining six hour 55, uh, you need to cross examine Mr. Williams, Mr. McKenzie and Mrs. Wall plus you need a little time for direct and redirect mm -hmm. of your own witnesses. Mm -hmm. So, Uh, ma Madam President, uh, thank you for the for the guidance. I I was uh, consulting my, my team. I think that the difficulty has been uh, with how we can estimate the time for for tomorrow. But uh, uh, our our proposal is that we we use our six and uh, how much time? Yeah, yeah, 6.55 minutes tomorrow to do all the three, uh, the three uh, witnesses. Right? Then we will, uh, we'll, because it's difficult to say how much time we will spend on our, so it was an estimate that of a maximum of three hours so that we know the next witness is prepared, but it's not an exact uh, 
uh, estimate. So oh, it might take two hours. So between, uh, so let's say, uh, because in the interest of time, we, we say the first witness two hours, that should be the maximum, so that we are able to move to the next witness. We can use uh, around uh, two hours also, one and a half, and then the rest of the time on the other, the other expert witness. I think that, that, that makes sense, absolutely. Now, uh, do you still want to start with Mr. Williams now? Maybe it, it, it would not be bad. Oh, according to my consultations here, we propose that we start tomorrow. Good. Then that is acceptable. I, it's, of course, acceptable. Uh, I just don't want us to be too pressed tomorrow. So my next proposal then is that we start tomorrow at 9, and that gives us a little bit more flexibility over the day. The, the problem is simply Mr. McKenzie uh, will be five hours ahead of us, so we, I mean, we can go on until six o'clock, but it would not be very, very nice to him. Acceptable. For, for us, we can start at nine. Yeah. Yes. Fine. Uh, Dr. White, you look I at think, me I like think I have said something <laughs> that is completely <laughs> inappropriate. Not, nothing inappropriate to say, but um, I think we've agreed to continue today, so. No, but, uh, but your opponents just said that now they want to stop. So sure. we can stop and, and, and start a little earlier tomorrow. Okay, fair that's enough. That, that's, uh, that's obviously okay for us. Just one thing to correct if there is a misunderstanding. It's not that we are going to hear all um, three witnesses or two witnesses plus one expert from the uh, claimant tomorrow. We are going to hear the two fact witnesses that were presented by the claimant, and then we are going to hear the fact witnesses presented by the respondent, and only then are we going on to quantum. Yeah, yeah. so if we have time for another one tomorrow, it would be Professor Muma. Yes. Yes, do we agree on that? So tomorrow we start with Mr. Williams, we start at nine, and then we proceed uh, remotely with Mr. McKenzie, and if we can, uh, we start, at least we start Mr. Uh, Professor Mruma. Are we agreed on this plan? Yes? Yes, yes we do, Madam President. Good. Then is there anything else that we need to uh, address before we adjourn for the day on the climate side? No, thank you, Madam. No? On your uh, on on our side. side, no. Then uh, uh, thank everyone for the cooperation today and uh, have all a nice evening. Although it may be a busy evening, but it can nevertheless be nice. Good. Thank, See thank you. See you tomorrow.